Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to Son of Liberty on Scope. Uh, we really, really want to thank all of the people at INCO, all the people at CAFRA, the amazing advocates that have been on before us. Uh, I've been in and out of the computer all day uh, listening to the wonderful live stream, starting with Clive Bates and the wonderful uh, panel that was uh, just playing now, the pre-recorded one with Nancy and Hennage and uh, Leanna and Paul and Sam. Um, amazing people have been on today, and I'm hoping um, that we can have a little fun with our show. We're uh, we're just kind of a couple chuckleheads that uh, have been fighting for vaping here in the states. Um, for all of our international uh, viewers that are paying attention to us for the first time, uh, we do a little show on Smoke Free Radio called Son of Liberty Radio, and uh, we talk. Uh, to consumers. Uh, we educate consumers and we try to bring them information uh, that will arm them uh, for their local fights. Um, over the last year, we've uh, focused a lot on our international brothers and sisters. Uh, we've been talking to international advocates, uh, international scientists, uh, policymakers um, from all over the globe. It's too many to name, um, but if you pay attention to uh, the pre-recorded content tonight, and tomorrow in the next couple of days, you'll see clips of some of our favorite guests. Um, I keep saying R, uh, my brother Kevin is backstage and uh, uh, Kevin is amazing. There's Kevin. Chucklehead 2 checking in. <laughs> Chucklehead 2. So uh, for those of you that are on Twitter, you will recognize Kevin uh, is uh, at Vaping It. He is a prolific Twitterer, so prolific that in several academic studies, uh, they have uh, outed him as being a bot. Uh, so uh, if, if, if he doesn't make robotic sounds when he moves, um, we apologize. We apologize. Uh, Kevin, have you been have you been watching the uh, the no. footage from today? You haven't seen a lot of stuff. I've seen very little, embarrassingly very little today. That's, so I'm so ashamed for you because there was some amazing stuff. There was even a a, a, a bunch of fellows from uh, Central and South America. We will be having some of them on um, on day uh, three of our coverage. We're we're blocking this exact hour out for the next four nights. Um, tonight is Kevin and I, we're going to have a little discussion about what is harm reduction and, uh, how does harm reduction and tobacco harm reduction intersect and just various other stuff about harm reduction in our daily life. Uh, tomorrow we will have a conversation about nicotine and neurodiversity. Um, and we will have several, uh, wonderful vaping advocates uh, who are neurodiverse like myself. Um, and we will talk about the benefits of nicotine um, in their conditions, in their lives. Uh, the, the next day, we will have a conversation with, uh, with our friend from Costa Rica, Jeffrey Zamora, and our new friend from Chile, uh, Ignacio. And uh, H will probably be in that conversation because H it has a plethora, a plethora of information about philanthrocolonialism and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Bloomberg. Uh, and then the last night, we were going to close our part of the coverage of Scope uh, with uh, having some uh, friends from here in the States on. And we will have uh, Demetrius Agrafiotis and Philbert Gassardo, Bassardo, Bassardo. Uh, yes. And we're going to talk about uh, smoking and uh, uh, interfacing with smoking. They do a little show called uh, The Smokers Show. Uh, where they uh, try to engage directly with smokers um, from a vaping point of view, but trying to help people quit smoking and, and talking about our technology and how it helps them. Yep. Um, so uh, down to the brass tacks, Kevin, um, we're going to talk about uh, harm reduction. But first, I think we should start out with World Health Organization chit chat. So um, okay. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, mm -hmm. And since I'm not in control, the wonderful producer will throw it up there as soon as they get a moment. But uh, we should talk about the World Health Organization and uh, their own website and their own words and human rights. Mm -hmm. um, so according to the World Health Organization, one of the main pillars of their, of their whole uh, house of cards is the, hu 
you know, is human rights. And, and they have a declaration, a universal declaration of human rights signed in 1948. Um, and what this does is it's supposed to enshrine the health, uh, enshrine health as a fundamental, fundamental human right to every human being on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, and there are several little aspects of their, uh, of, of their little declaration that's supposed to be, per, you know, forever in perpetuity. Um, we're going to skip through a lot of this because there's a lot of stuff about human rights laws and how their policies are typically um, adopted into international law. But we're going to scroll down here. There's a couple things um, that are important. And, um, uh, oh, it's not even on this tab. It's on this tab. So human rights and, 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 and health. So, again, their constitution signed in 1946. It does give basic stuff. Understanding health as a human right creates a legal obligation on states to ensure access to timely, acceptable, and affordable health care of appropriate quality. And that's talking about medical care. That's not really talking about quality of life. But then it does go down to determining um, a, such as safe and potable water, sanitation, food, housing, health-related information, which is important. Mm -hmm. No misinformation. Yep. And education. And then goes on to say about gender equality. Um, there's some stuff in here that are very that is very important because... Um, these are these are human rights, right? This is mm -hmm. this is a basic understanding of what the World Health Organization is supposed to do. They're supposed to protect those that can't protect themselves. So if right. you keep going, if you keep going, it says a rights-based approach to health requires that health policy programs must prioritize the needs of the furthest behind first mm -hmm. which means that you need to go into the low to middle income countries and foster programs that are humane in helping them get to the same quality of life of other people um, and they should do this without discrimination race age ethnicity and other status blah 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 um, and then the last one, this one here, I think is very important. Another feature of rights-based approaches is meaningful participation. And participation means ensuring that national stakeholders bring in all of these other groups, including us, right? Mm -hmm. Non-governmental organizations, it says right there. Yep. Um, and they should, we as a organization, we as a group of people, should be part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. And then um, it's important because it says the right to health is one of a set of internationally agreed human rights standards and is inseparable or indivisible from those other rights. So again, they can't take them away from you. They can't revoke them. Um, mm -hmm. Then we talk about uh, autonomy. This is, uh, you know, the right to decide what happens to your own body without interference, which is, there's some overlap. I mean, this is specifically talking about reproductive and sexual rights, but also being able to decide what happens inside of your own body. That's important. Um, so, you know, free from torture and non-consensual medical treatment and experimentation. So this basically means that they are acknowledging that, Human health is a human right. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to talk about FCTC, Kevin. You and I have had this conversation multiple times. But oh. for other people, we, we're, we're going to bring up that there's a thing. There's And if you listened to the uh, recorded content um, that was played earlier, you'll see that it was brought up that there's uh, two uh, framework convention treaties. One is on climate and the other one is on tobacco. That's it. Those are the only two World Health Organization treaties. So if we go to this, this is an actual printout. This is an actual, you know, PDF file yep. of the Framework Convention on Tobacco mm -hmm. Control. There's a lot of information up here. I invite everyone who has not already read this to go and get it and read it. There's, uh, there's no harm in knowing what your enemies have on their mind. Mm -hmm. So we, we go down here and we're going to go right into the introduction. 
And it starts with Article 1, and it talks about uh, illicit trade of tobacco. Then it talks about uh, regional economic integration organization. Again, that's not the point I'm drawing your attention to. Then it speaks about tobacco advertising and promotion, mm -hmm. which is C. But then Article D. Article D says tobacco control means a range of supply, demand, and harm reduction strategies uh, hmm. that aim to improve the health of a population by eliminating or reducing their consumption of tobacco products and exposure to tobacco smoke. So clearly, they understand that there's such a thing as harm reduction. Mm -hmm. They've defined it down here as reducing exposure to harmful tobacco products. Mm -hmm. So it's right in their treaty that they mm -hmm. should actually be promoting, pushing, and, um, you know, pushing for harm reduction strategies. Any, any harm reduction strategy. Right. So now we get to talk about what is harm reduction, Kevin? Good. So in your mind, on a very elementary level, mm -hmm. what is harm reduction? To lessen the cause of death or disease or injury in, in some cases. Um, elementary being my grandson will run through and I'll say, S slow down, or I will grab him from falling when he does. That's that's his bottom line. As that, I is, that is as primal, as basic of an uh, understanding of what harm reduction is. It's basically mm -hmm. strategies or things that you do, behaviors or products that you use that reduce mm -hmm. the harm of your choices, of your mm -hmm. behaviors. So... You know, on a, on a basic level, you know, when you were a kid back in old timey days, Kevin and I are old, <laughs> uh, automobiles did not have seat belts. And if they water. did, nobody used them. Um, and you're riding in the car with your mother and she slams on the brakes. The first thing mom does is slam that arm out to protect you from flying through the windshield. That is harm reduction. They were part of the brakes. <laughs> yes. Um, harm reduction would be. Uh, don't run with scissors. That's right. That is that is a form of harm reduction. It is something that you do to prevent harm. It's it's uh, that is very much the the definition of the basics of harm reduction. Now, um, in, in in literally, you know, uh, just uh, opening your eyes before you start walking. That <laughs> harm reduction. You know, I mean, it could be as as uh you know basic as that is um wait helmets. A minute, oh looky there helmets safety goggles yes, we're gonna get into we're gonna get into the the fine tuning <laughs> of that in a moment we have we have a tweet kevin no we do not do we have we have a, a very awesome tweet that that we discussed on our you know kevin and i we did oh, a right. sort of a warm up show last week um that uh you know allowed us to test if we could finish this topic in an hour um mm -hmm. and i apologize to whoever comes after because we're going to try to get it done but you know i don't know they may just end up pulling pulling the feed out from under us kevin yep. but uh i did this tweet um a good while ago this i mean i can't remember this is from february of this year so right. i'm going to again throw it up on screen for the producer to to add to the screen, but the gist of it is, um, I asked the question, uh, what if we lived in a world without harm reduction? Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a frightening thing to discuss and to, you know, to imagine all of the different things that we, we, uh, embrace on a daily basis that are harm reduction. And it could, and it could be a lot of different things. So we're going to talk about some of the, the most basic stuff. Um, and then, you know, we'll scroll through this. And uh, if if the producer, uh, I think it's Paul, if Paul is backstage and throws it up on screen, oh, there it is. He heard my name or he didn't say his name. Ta -da! So, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, you you mentioned, you know, life life jackets and, and stuff like that. So, yes, uh, if we lived in a world without harm reduction, um, thousands of kids would drown uh, that didn't have to because there were no life jackets. Mm -hmm. uh, 
there would be millions of more vehicular accidents and deaths because we talked about seatbelts a while ago because there's no seatbelts. Yep. Um, and obviously something that a lot of people don't want to talk about. And, and it was actually mentioned in one of the live streams earlier today, condoms. Yep. We would have a huge overpopulation problem. Um, well, depends on how many accidents we had, but there would be a lot more unwanted children um, <laughs> because there's no condoms. And yep. uh, I can't remember who brought up teen sex in one of the earlier panels. Uh, but yeah, I mean, all of these things, these things people tend to, I mean, obviously uh, condom distribution was uh, problematic here in the States, at least for years. And I think in certain communities, it's still a problem, but they felt like if you handed out condoms to teenagers, it would just promote promiscuous sex. Um, I don't think the numbers rule or bear that out. I think pretty much the same number of kids that were, that were doing it are still doing it. <laughs> they were still doing it. But this time, they're not having unwanted children. It's safer. Uh, and, you know, less disease, uh, AIDS, mm -hmm. uh, you know, hepatitis, all sorts of really nasty things, herpes, crabs, uh, gonorrhea. Uh, I'm sure Kevin has an ex experience with some of those things, but, you know. Trip, trip, trip. So yeah, that, 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 I think that, that, into the, into the mid-80s, it, it became uh, more acceptable for condoms. But Yeah, but, you know, you didn't want to be that. Death. You didn't want to be that teenager, that 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 boy. I mean, boys get embarrassed about stuff like that. You you know, you don't want to be the guy running into the drugstore to try to buy them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so those things are all beneficial and mostly embraced. Mm -hmm. But then we talk about other things. So, um, you know, guns here in the states, at least, and some other countries, people have the right to bear arms. Um, and there would be a lot more people die from firearms related deaths and people are freaking out about the number we have now, but we have yeah. in place safety locks and different things that we use that are harm reduction strategies to prevent people that shouldn't have them and, and kids from playing with them, um, yeah. so that they don't harm each other or themselves. Um, you know, I went to high school, there was, uh, a, a couple kids, uh, got out of, you know, their dad's gun from the night nightstand and, were playing with them and hurt themselves. I mean, it is possible. Um, and that was in the, you know, a long time ago in the seventies when it wasn't really promoted that you should have a gun lock on your safe, on your gun. Right. Um, but, you know, think of a world without air traffic controllers, Kevin, these are the important people that sit in the control rooms of airports and tell airplanes where to go <laughs> so that they don't run into each other in that vastness of the sky planes yep. still uh, have close calls yes, they because do. the people that navigate the planes are trying to find the most fuel efficient route. And a lot mm -hmm. of times they overlap. So yeah. if it wasn't for those guys sitting in those rooms, pushing 10, that's the phrase pushing 10 uh, are the air traffic controllers. That's the action that they do. They they're pushing 10. Um, we would have lots more plane crashes yeah. and lots more death. Um, then we have uh you know, fire extinguishers in a world without fire extinguishers, how many mm -hmm. more millions, if not billions of people would die in fire accidents because there was nothing to put out those fires, kitchen fire. You know, here in the States, we have multiple kinds of fire uh, extinguishers. We have chemical fire extinguishers. We have wood uh, fire extinguishers for chemical fires. We have fire extinguishers for oil. We have fire extinguishers for wood. And each Man. one of those was what, what? And, and we have smoke detectors and heat yes. detectors and carbon monoxide detectors before the all fires those, and the bad things happen. Yeah, All of those things yeah. are important. Yeah. And how many people would die? I mean, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning is a silent killer. Mm -hmm. Like there could be no fire in your home. And if there's a carbon monoxide buildup or a carbon monoxide leak, your whole family could die Yep, in their sleep. And never know, um, and nobody would ever know that anything was wrong. So that is harm reduction, the ability to reduce harm based on an early warning that something yep. bad is happening. Um, I see Addie's in the chat room talking pulling squeeze sweep. That is how to use a fire extinguisher. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. And then obviously, if there's no food regulations, FDA does 
some decent things. And, uh, you know, one of the panelists earlier was talking about how the U.S. FDA is the gold standard when it comes to food protections. And Quality, that the, rules yeah. that, the rules that they pass to regulate how food is distributed and, and processed and, 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 you know, handled, manufactured and handled in the United States has saved billions of people. So if there were no uh, if there were no food regulations, how many people would get uh, salmonella and, you know, all sorts of other nasty foodborne illnesses mm -hmm. because no one is there to protect them? Yep. That is harm reduction. And far be it for me to say something nice about the FDA, but that is a part of their mission that protects society. And, um, you know, exactly. they do a great job because we are the gold standard. Um we, uh, yep. the Americas, you know, we actually do one thing right. So uh, what about no safety protocols in uh, nuclear power plants, Kevin? Uh, three mile island? <laughs> I mean, we've had, we've had some close calls here in the States when it comes mm -hmm. to nuclear accidents. I mean, Chernobyl was huge and that's not here, but we had three mile island. We've had lots of other close calls um, yep. and there would be even more disastrous outcomes if we didn't have safety protocols in place in those nuclear power plants um, and those other types of facilities that do all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, yep. And, you know, just think of America being a nuclear wasteland because some uh, janitor in a nuclear power plant in the bread basket of the United States, right in the center of the United States, or to trip the wrong alert, or to push the wrong button and cause a meltdown, and that you know that would cause disease, pestilence, food shortages, all sorts of awful things. Lots awful of things, Kevin. Yeah, I mean, we wouldn't be able to. Uh, we wouldn't be able to have bread. We wouldn't be able to have all of the wonderful things that we get from uh, mm -hmm. the crops of America. Um, so yeah. I mean, uh, hey, you used to run a business, right, Kevin? You had like a taxi company or something like yep. that. Yep. Um, and there, there was an organ. There is in the United States an organization that governs the safety of workplaces. Mm -hmm. I think it's called OSHA, O S H A, and they have regulations in place um, in different work settings to prevent accidents at work. Yep. So. If there were no OSHA, if there were no uh, agency uh, establishing safety rules for uh, how workplace environments are maintained and different rules for safety, how many people, you know, in the States, I don't know, you see this um, in, in a lot of movies, you'll see like people working in a factory and you'll see a sign, no accident in X days, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a that's a thing to I mean, if think about it. I mean, if you work at the Amazon a distribution center and God bless right. Amazon, I give them a lot of money. Um, <laughs> I'm actually using a new monitor. I had to replace my monitor, Kevin. The, the, uh, the yeah. monitor number two fried out on me and I had to order a new one mm -hmm. um, and it came it came on Sunday. God bless Amazon for being a, you, you know, the ability to order something and it arrive in your house and you don't have to go to the store. But Amazon is one of those places that has not a really great work uh, uh, accident record. They've had some pretty, pretty awful accidents in, in Amazon facilities over the years. Um, but it would be way worse if employers were able to demand their employees work in unsafe conditions. Um, and that there would be no gov government uh, overreach or not overreach because this is actually something that we need, but uh, oversight. That's the word. Mm -hmm. um, oversight on how to maintain their work environment and what, how many hours can your employees work before they have to have a break or be fatigued, things like that. Um, so those labor safety regulations are very important. And again, a type of harm reduction. And yep. Embraced by most people, except for the billionaire employers, you know, there is that. Mm -hmm. um, but what about a world where, the, you know, we talked about FDA, you know, being in, awesome with food. Mm -hmm. What about a world where FDA didn't have oversight of, of pharmaceuticals? 
and drug companies could manufacture whatever they wanted and sell whatever they wanted without testing it, without making sure that it was safe. I mean, there are there are certain things that a market will um, absorb. Right. Certain number of losses before the market will correct yeah. in a in a mm -hmm. system like ours. But in other countries, governments pay for those meds. Governments buy those meds. What if there was nobody overseeing the safety of those meds? How many people would die of drug problems because um, there, you know, there is no FDA to oversee that? And as we heard in one of the earlier presentations, FDA is the gold standard when it comes to pharmaceutical stuff too. Yep. So a lot of companies get their stuff passed in the United States, and then when they try to sell it in other countries. All they have to do is say it's been tested by FDA and approved for the market in the United States, and other countries will just blank check that shit. Yep. Well, that was so think about how many billions of people would die if yep. nobody was there to call the drug manufacturers out on their nonsense. And drug interactions, too. The, I mean, that even happens now with the FDA. Right, right. Drug interactions are, are pretty standard knowledge when when a uh, pharmacist gets the prescription, hey, you're on this, hey, you're on that, you can't take this, you're gonna have to take something else, call your doctor back. That's don't that's take this and that together. Yeah. Don't do Good. this, don't do that. Right. Those sort of things happen all the time. Drug interactions. But sometimes people just have an allergic reaction to a new drug that they didn't even know that nobody knew. That's unpredictable stuff. I mean yep. I know what I'm allergic to because I've lived in the world and have participated in life. However, if I take a new pharmaceutical that mm -hmm. is not something that was tested, then God forbid I could have an allergic reaction and die. Yep. Yep. With no warning because this is a new a new drug. That's what happened with Janice, yeah. So I work in healthcare, Kevin. Yep. You know that. Um Mm -hmm. We have rules. We have rules that we have to follow even before the COVID. You have personal protective equipment, PPE? I have a truckload of PPE in my truck. Good uh, for you. But even before COVID, I, I used to do wound care, for example. So yeah. during wound care, I have to have sterile fields. I have to have uh, sterile equipment. I have to have sealed uh, 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 steel debridement kits and things that are all sealed. They're They're sterile. Uh, sterile gloves. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know this, Kevin, but the, those those gloves that you buy in a box at yep. the grocery store, at Sam's, at whatever, yep. uh, at uh, Harbor Freight here in the United States, at Harbor Freight, um, those gloves are not sterile. No. <laughs> no, I did so know that. I, yes. I'm sure you, you know, some people may not know that. I mean, when you go no, they're not. Uh, for a uh, procedure, for example, if you're having surgery, um, the gloves that the surgeon wears are prepared individually yep. and they are sterile and they're packaged in such a way that you can put them on by only touching the inside of the glove. Yep. And then you have to, you know, they're fold the, the, the wrist is folded up. You can touch the inside of the glove to put it on and you fold that flap down. Um, those are sterile gloves. But think of think of a world where there is no PPE, there is no infection control uh, procedures. Think about uh, in the past in the United States, we had a huge, and I'm sure it's everywhere, but we had a huge tuberculosis problem in the late 1800s in the United States. I'm sure Skip Murray in the chat room will remember this. Uh, you know, there was a huge a huge problem with uh, with the consumption or with tuberculosis, and this was because we did not understand the disease process. We did not understand uh, infections and how they work. Um, but we do now. But think about a world with no infection control, no uh, no basic hygiene. I mean, all of these are parts of infection control. Um, mm -hmm. san basic sanitation, all of those things are important to preventing. <laughs> A world, um, a worldwide epidemic of dirtiness. I and mean, washing really. washing hands. Uh, a surgeon decided to start washing his hands and found the infections went down or something in the teens or twenties, if I remember. Right. Oh yeah, no, I mean, well, I mean, uh, if you know your, you know your history. You now this is going to be very esoteric, Kevin. 
<laughs> but no, it's fine. We can go down this rabbit hole real quick. So you've heard of Nostradamus. Yes. The, 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 uh, uh he's the guy that read the future. Uh, uh, but he yeah. was also a doctor. Okay. I did not know that. And, um, he actually was one of, during the black plague. He was, uh, one of the first people to start pushing basic hygiene and hand washing in plague zones to try to okay. reduce the infection he figured it out i Maybe mean he, was him I was he thought okay. it was tiny evil spirits or something probably but uh, he had figured out that there was a microbial mm -hmm. thing whether that was a spirit or whatever i mean i'm not trying you know I, I i love reading you know his predictions and things but um but he was a doctor and um his patients survived they had a much higher survival rate than other doctors because he pushed basic hand washing techniques imagine how simple that was yes crazy crazy yeah. but i mean just going into the doctor to have surgery even today kevin we have a huge mrsa uh vre all sorts of nasty things that live in the surgery surgery theaters um and in the staff. hospitals and recovery areas staff in fact well that's that's mrs staff is that, okay MRSA. Mercy. yeah um so yeah those are uh those are still there yeah but think how bad it would be without, without mm -hmm. uh, sanitation, without all these things. Le Legionnaires' um, disease is still around once in a while. Well, Legionnaires' dirty water, man. That's I mean, that's you know, uh, stagnant water, uh, bad, uh, unclean water systems, unclean uh, filtration systems. Um, all happens. those things are are pretty bad, pretty bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, then we talk about uh, we live in a world where if I'm building a house, I have to go. And I have to have an architect and uh, people build plans and, and you know, everything has to be detailed. And then you have to go to the building planner and get a, a permit mm -hmm. to do all of this. Um, but, you know, think of a world where anybody could just build anything mm -hmm. without any sort of engineering, you know, basically, <laughs> you know, and, and I've been and, and, and I'm, I've been in some really uh, poor countries. Mm hmm where you're looking at the construction of some of these homes and it looks like, you know, a yeah. good stiff wind would knock them over. Yep. Now think about that on a grand scale and every country, mm -hmm. um, every country in the world, uh, yep. didn't, there was no safety standards with, when it comes to, no. uh, uh, you know, building stuff, no structural, no, no structural regulations. As long as it stays up long enough for us to, us to go. <laughs> yep. Is it, is it, uh, what is that called? Uh, um, Hillbilly uh, engineering? No, no refunds. No refunds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My work is my work is guaranteed until the moment I step off the property. Two tail lights or thirty seconds. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this next one is very important to me, Kevin. I know this one is very important to me. I know we should um, have a moment of silence. <laughs> <laughs> what if we lived in a world where there were no alcohol uh, regulations, no safety regulations for alcohol? It'd be anarchy. <laughs> um, this would not be good. I, no. Well, I take a drink. <laughs> no, it would be no good at all to almost everyone. This is an interesting um, beverage. Peach and pecan. Ooh. Ale. Adults don't like flavors. No, no. no, no. <laughs> I am I am a 50-year-old child, Kevin. That's um, right. And, and I don't like things that taste good. I think we've covered that in depth on Son of Liberty Radio. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So um, if it's unsafe alcohol products, that's, that's a huge encompassment across the world. Well, we actually have a historical precedent for... for this yes. this is one of the reasons why it's included in the list because mm -hmm. here in the uh, the states there was a period of time called prohibition and this is when the government in their infinite wisdom decided to uh to to ban all alcohol this, in the united states this was this was bloomberg's parents well, this is probably one of his predecessors <laughs> you know but uh, in their infinite wisdom, they decided that uh, that everybody had to live a puritanical life and could mm -hmm. not have fun. Um, and obviously, our human nature is, is that we're going to do the things that we enjoy. That's so right. 
people tried to figure out ways to uh, to circumvent the system by illegally producing alcohol. And uh, one of the one of the byproducts of that is that people didn't have the expertise or the wherewithal to do it properly and safely. And yeah, we had um, large yeah. numbers of people hospitalized and dead because of unpure alcohol. Um, That's where bathtub I, gin came from. The phrase bathtub gin came from that. Uh, the phrase blind drunk, blind drunk came from yep. that because people would drink uh, poorly filtered alcohol and lose their uh, gift of sight. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there is that. My yep. wife is here. Hello, wife. Um, I'm on the <laughs> air right now. Hello to thousands Hi. of people. Bye. She just came home from the hospital where she was saving hundreds of people's lives. See? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she saves yours every night. Bye, Bye she says. <laughs> she saves you every night from, from hurting you. Or yourself. Was, she does. She does save me for myself many, many times. She is a. She is a saint. She's an um, angel. Yes. So uh, now we have live proof that I actually do have a wife, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> she won't admit it in public. I'm sure. That's, no, that's no. Okay. She holds my hand. She she adores me because I'm right. God. No. Anyway. All right. So yeah, there there the alcohol thing is very important, and we do know for a fact that when you tell people not Don't. to do something oh my god kevin there, there this could be an in this could be one of those moments where we we, we actually branch off i'm going to try not to because we right. do have a video of the child of a prohibitionist saying when you tell a child not to do something there is every that's motivation and incentive for them to do the thing that you told them not to do that's so great. let's i will you know if you go to my twitter you will have seen that tweet so anyway mm -hmm. let there is that so uh, what about just product safety standards in general. Oh my God. I mean, uh, every product in, uh, that's electrical has what they call a UL. Yep. Most, you know, they have a UL uh, medallion on the on the uh, on the back that basically says that this item has been tested for safety. This design has been tested for safety. They don't test every one, but they do test yep. the, the the actual design to make sure it is safe. Automobiles. Um, just uh, oh, thousands and thousands of components in the automobiles are tested for safety and they have to follow certain regulations for the gauge of the wire to the type of steel yep. in the frame to all of these safety things. glass yeah so back in the old timey days when glass yep. was just glass in cars and people would get yep. like, sliced to ribbons because their windshield cracked or broke yeah yep. um those are all important um what about a world, and, and actually in my lifetime, and I know in your lifetime, Kevin, you have existed in a world where there was no such thing as 911. <laughs> I don't remember it, but I'm sure you're right. <laughs> you know, there, there's a thing, like right now, if there's an accident or an incident in my home, I can call 911, and paramedics will rush to my home to prevent me from dying um, or protect people from dying in my home. Um, my mom was an EMT, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I have, I have made, uh, I have made 911 calls from home, from workplace, um, from mm -hmm. the side of the street, um, yep. because, you know, it's there. That's the whole purpose is to, uh, to, to send aid when needed. But think of, think of the idea of a world with no first responders. Yep. Think about this, Kevin. How many people? How many more people could have died on September 11th if FDNY and uh, you know FDPD did not run towards the accident? Yep. No many, first many responders. More. I mean, I mean the the definition of hero is somebody that doesn't run away from the disaster but runs to the disaster. Yeah. So. That uh, is, uh, uh, you know, the, the, in my definition of hero, that is, you know, the people that run towards trouble, not the people that run away from it. Yeah. Um, and if they didn't exist, billions of people would die. Yeah. There's no doubt in my mind, billions um, over time. 
Um, how about, uh, you know, and we talked about waste, waste disposal and sanitation earlier, but think mm -hmm. about it back in old timey days, again, in your lifetime, Kevin, um, <laughs> you know, if you watch movies like, uh, the gangs of New York. Yeah. So there's a wonderful scene there in, you know, New York city and the turn of the century. And, uh, people are waking up from the, uh, the, the night they're getting up in the morning and they go to their window, they lift up their window and they pick up the night jar. <laughs> Some of you may not know what that is, but it is a, it is a chamber. vessel. It is a chamber pot. Chamber um, pot. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. And just threw it out the window into the street. Mm -hmm. There were no, uh, there were no uh, sewers. <laughs> there were just ditches. That's and why people, you had those screens over the first floor. <laughs> and people on the sidewalk sometimes got little gifts, little gifts. Um, oh. And we had horrible diseases. We had dysentery and all sorts of nasty stuff mm -hmm. um, because of that. Because, of, I mean, cholera. Cholera existed in, in Kevin's lifetime. Um, <laughs> Harm um, reduction is being far enough away that you can't be touched. <laughs> harm reduction is saying mean things about Kevin when he's 1,100 miles away. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Man. Ugh. People's lives every single day. They turn on a light switch. It's grounded. They, they I just get noticed. The car. I, I just noticed uh, Mark. Uh, the, the the wonderful Skip Murray uh, has been, and she's been in this chat room all day, pretty much. And we put her to sleep. <laughs> and and Mark, her husband, says, uh, Skip has passed out. And uh, how do I turn off her phone? Yeah. Uh, see. Mark, Mark is one of my lovely friends who takes pictures of Skip with her phone and posts them on Twitter for me. I hope he did. <laughs> I, I, I hope the battery wasn't dead. Um, so... Uh, what if we lived in a world where there were no traffic lights and no traffic signs? You'd be in New York City. Oh, no. No, no. Right. They actually do have traffic lights and traffic signs, and some people just choose not to obey them. But um, think of a world where people chose, and ever that would be every person, because no mm -hmm. one is voluntarily going to yield the right of way. Mm -hmm. They're gonna. They're just going to keep going. And and you're gonna have to slam on the brakes because they're not stopping. Slow caution, yeah. Slow so, caution, yield. Nope. <laughs> yeah. So think of that. I mean, how many car accidents would happen every second of every day if there were no, uh, there were no traffic lights? Again, lights patterns, all of these yeah. things, Kevin. All of these things are some are, are in some way, shape, or form a definition of harm reduction. Yep. And by most accounts, um, a benefit. To society, mm -hmm. just like uh, um, there's a spot over here where I live. If you are unfamiliar with it, you're gonna you're gonna sail through a stop sign into oncoming traffic, cross traffic. It looks as if it's just a road, and they change the stop sign from just a plain old stop sign to a flashing, which you've seen on on the highways, I'm sure everywhere. But it's a flashing stop sign. During the day, even it's a significant difference that just them little lights are just a little bit safer, you know. Mm -hmm. Just so. just a blinking yellow light to say, "Hey, pay attention." Yep. yep. All of those things are important and exactly. save billions bi over time, billions of lives. Yep. Um. And uh, now, now let's talk about one of the topics of our time. Oh yeah. Vaccines. So in Kevin in my lifetime, we've had viral outbreaks of basic childhood diseases that have mm -hmm. been harmful to uh, the population. Yep. Now, uh, you know, nobody's died from the measles in the States, at least, for decades. All right. But measles used to wipe out entire, entire, uh, you know, cities back in, or villages. Yep. Um. You know, we talked about cholera. There's no, um, there's no vaccine for that, but we've we've defeated it. 
mm-hmm. with hygiene. Um, smallpox. Yep. We've defeated that with a vaccine. Defeated it so much that my brother had to get the smallpox vaccine when he was a kid, but I didn't because it I was don't... no longer it was no longer mandatory, and my parents never got it. So I don't have the little the little dimple on my arm that every my wife has one because okay. she's from the I Philippines do. and yeah. they're mandatory in the Philippines even now. But uh, in the United States, it it stopped being mandated. So uh, I'm. 49 years old. My brother's mm-hmm. only five years older than me, and he oh, has 53. one, yep, I and I one. don't. Yep. So sometime between his childhood and my childhood, which, I mean, we were both children at the same time, but his birth and my birth, it became not required. Yep. But all of the diseases that we have destroyed or wiped out or controlled via vaccine would come back with a passion, with a rampage, if we had entire populations that were not vaccinated for measles, mumps, rubella, diphtheria, all those things are childhood vaccinations in America that are required for kids to go to public school. Mm -hmm. That's right. We do have vaccine mandates, kids. Um, Just saying. Um, And we don't complain about those. I mean, there are a small population of people that uh, uh, are stupid. And um, do push back on those vaccines because they read a study that said that uh, it, they cause autism. Uh, and the scientists that produced that study actually had to uh, revoke or re- – what's the word, Kevin? Retract, retract his science. He retracted his studies because they were bullshit. But anyway, they have – I'm sorry I used a bad word. I know that Nancy's going to Nancy's gonna get mad at me, but it, Hi, it, you know – H H uh, H was quite impassioned earlier, so I I feel like we're okay, Kevin. H Plus, knows he knows he knows <laughs> H knows. I know he knows. He knows he knows. <laughs> and then I again, we talked man. about fire extinguishers a while ago. But what about uh, you know how many people? You know, you remember this because you're old. Um, <laughs> people people uh, fell asleep in their bed with a. Uh, uh, Flammable pajamas and um, mm-hmm. flammable mattresses. You know, back yep. in old timey days, they were feather mattresses. Yep. And so, what's a so main component so. of foul feathers? Oil. That's one of the things. Foul. <laughs> water fowl, you know. Yep. Feathers are made out of d- down, mm-hmm. which is a foul. I'm, I'm not Halloween saying bad cost- things. Halloween costumes to jackets to all kinds of things. And All they had to, things. including Mallory cigarettes. Says, Mallory says, "Call it like it is." BS is BS. Um, <laughs> Even cigarettes, they added so, the flame retardant to it. I, I, you know, people would, especially people that lived in you know environments where there was you know smoke. Mm-hmm. Cigarette smokers would die in their beds. Yep. In the middle of the night, burn themselves to death because their pajamas and their mattresses were both uh, flammable, highly yeah. flammable. I mean, like I said, duck feathers have oil. They have their yeah. own, you know, duck to, to help the water run off. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, it, you know, they save people's lives when they prevent it, when they made, you know, fire retardant materials and fire retardant uh, beds, mm-hmm. mattresses. Um, yeah. So those are important. And again, with fire extinguishers with fire alarms everything works together to make it even more safe yep so now we get to talk about drug policy stuff and these guys in drug policy reform guys like ethan nadelman and uh you know dr uh uh, mark tyndall Mm -hmm. who's been on our show um uh have been fighting for drug policy reform and 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 a compassionate approach to uh you know treatment for people that are addicted to uh, drugs in general, a wide range of drugs. Um, and, you know, one of the things that uh, is quite acceptable today is uh, naloxone or suboxone um, for people to not die yep. when they overdose. And um, Kevin, again, you're an ex cabbie. Yep. I'm sure that you've had close calls. Yep. I had him in the cab. I had my wife. She almost died. 
did you have a suboxone or a naloxone nope, thing back re- in? No, not in. No, hell no, not in the eighties. Now, um, when Janice took, uh, she had taken some Aleve, and she was on other meds for her Alzheimer's. Ooh. And she took it the second time. She had the reaction. She fell on the floor. Oh yeah, that was it. Stuff. And I called nine one one, which was the other side of that statement you made earlier. Yeah. So, um, this is weird. I mean, obviously, uh, people OD from either o- too much. I mean, overdose uh, could be many things. I mean, we use that term uh, pretty blanketly uh, from yeah. either too much, too pure, um, or a uh, bad quality. Mm-hmm. You know, not cut, not cut with the right thing. Yep. Um, and if you've ever seen somebody get this, it's like it's like seeing somebody get an adrenaline shot when they're having a heart attack. Yeah. Okay. Or they're in VTAC or whatever. Um, to see some the 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 immediate yeah. effectiveness of naloxone. Is amazing. I mean, you 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 got a guy laying on the gurney or laying on the ground, essentially, mm-hmm. you know, crusty mucus like flowing mm-hmm. out of the side of their mouth, ready to go. Yeah, uh, eyes rolled back into the back of their head. You know, non-responsive pupils, and you stab them in the chest with this stuff. It's mm-hmm. like you put a battery cable on them; yeah. they jump right out of it. It it, it is. I've seen people ODing on the ground, foaming at the mouth, get this, and in a minute, two minutes, they're standing yep. up and walking away. Yeah. At gate, at, at Hell's Gate, at Death's Gate, at the, you know, knocking at the door of the Grim Reaper one moment. Yep. And walking away. I mean, obviously looking a little fucked up, but still walking away alive. Uh, and this, I mean, again, in most of society, at least here, um, mm-hmm. nobody thinks twice. Nope. Nope. This is important. This is harm reduction. Obviously, uh, needle exchanges. We we People talk have... a lot about nothing yeah. about us without us, but we yeah. didn't invent that. No hell no. That is that is not ours. We no. we might use it. But we're just borrowing it because the H, uh, the HIV AIDS people, they're the ones that created that. It's their yeah. fight that they use that for. And God bless them for not complaining that we're borrowing it because yeah. they fought. And there were God bless millions, them for fighting. millions of people that didn't need to die, died yeah. because of blind stupidity from yep. governments across the world, ours included. Yep. Um, you know, think about uh, decriminalization uh, and talk about uh, for-profit prison systems here in the States. Mm-hmm. If we had a better prison system, we had better, uh, better methods of reform instead of, instead of a, a, a turnstile door going into and out of the jail, revolving door, Kevin, yep. Yep. Um, we could save many, many lives because you're stuck in that and that just, you know, that hamster wheel, you're not getting well. anywhere, you know, you're just running and running and running and you're in the same place because the system is not designed to make you better. No, help. a lot of people in prison are people like me that, you know, we're neurodiverse. We, you know, you know, one bad turn from in my life and I could be in yep. the wrong, I could be behind bars. I could be that guy because bad temper, poor impulse control. Obsessive, mm-hmm. compulsive, bipolar, OCD, all of those things are mine. And mm-hmm. if I hadn't, if I didn't have the right person steering the road for me or uh, giving me options that were uh, not dangerous, um, I, I could yeah. be in, I could be in that bad place. Yeah. Billion and people die in that, in that prison system. Mm-hmm. Um, and just think about, we live in a society where science is supposed to be embraced, but it's not. And there are billions of people dying yep. or yep. dead because of ignorance of science science yes. in itself is harm reduction yep. and we live yes, in a world true. where it's where it's looked down upon by some by certain groups so i mean it's important to realize that all of these things 
we're only up to W. There's still uh, X, Y, and Z left, and we we only <laughs> have we have five minutes, Kevin. So, uh, in 1964, two years after uh, the Royal College of Physicians report on smoking, the U.S. Surgeon General came out with his report. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, I do like your X, Mowgli, but that would be Z plus one. But we'll get to that <laughs> later. Um, so billions of dead uh, because they couldn't breathe. Yep. And that would be even more. I mean, we ha since the Surgeon General's report in 1964, clearly there's been a billion people die of smoking. Yeah. Since 1964. Doesn't even have to be 100 years because more people smoked back then. Yep. But if the Surgeon General's report hadn't come out. Or it was and, ignored. Or, well, just just think about it. The, the people at the time that were doing all of the science and the people that are today doing the best science on tobacco are the same assholes. Mm -hmm. But now they've got a different mission statement. Now they're mm -hmm. actually doing science. It's not, it's not uh, some sort of weird religious thing for them. They're actually providing science. Mm -hmm. So that's important. The 1964 Surgeon General's report is basically where we got our uh, tobacco start. Yep. Uh, and I think that the Surgeon General at the time really did want to save billions of lives. Yes. Um, what, about, what about a world with no smoke or with no vaping, Kevin? There's, I I'm can say clearly smoking. with a clear conscience and an eye towards realism that 50 million people in this world are not dead yep. and won't die early because of vaping. Yep. I mean, there are there are some really crazy estimates out there. I can, with a clear conscience, say that 50 million is a reasonable number. Right. But 50 million people uh, alive is way better than 50 million people dead, Kevin. Yep. I would um, be one. Yeah. Hey, what if we lived in a world where people were not um, accepted for being different? Oh, Some shit. We actually... Movies. Still we, do. Actually still, we actually do live in a world where people are not accepted for being different. Some places they still do. So we need to push more on this, uh, uh, that part of the, the human experience. We need to, we need to kind of um, embrace the idea mm -hmm. that we're, all, we're not all the same, but yep. we're all equal. Um, because at the end of the day, especially in our circles... The people that are in the trenches with us, yep. they don't look like us. They don't talk like us. No. They come from a different place. Um, and that's the important thing that we're doing with this show, we're doing with Son of Liberty Radio, is to um, invite people uh, that don't look like us, that don't talk like us, um, into the conversation. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, their diversity... Their differences make us stronger. All inclusive. Um, so, you know, we should accept harm reduction in every aspect of our lives. And we should allow people um, of every uh, every background, every, mm -hmm. uh, every, every story is the same. We've done that, Kevin, on our show. We've had vapors from all over the world. Come and yep. tell their personal stories, and if you if you just uh, wrote it down, if they wrote their story down, and Kevin wrote his story down, and I wrote my story down, and Pippa and Raj and Mowgli and Shannon yep. and Paul uh, and Addie and Mallory and all the people that are watching the show right now, and I just that's not everybody, that's just the ones that are in this window that I'm looking at right now. Uh, yep. They wrote their stories down. Um, you could translate their stories into any language. And they would still be the same as the people that live in other countries. Yep. So uh, this is the end of the first night of our participation in Scope. And uh, we don't want to go long because there are actually people waiting, Kevin. It's 9 o'clock. Yep. We actually made it on yep. time. So uh, appreciate <laughs> it. Uh, love everybody. Uh, and we'll see you in 24 or 23 hours now. Tomorrow night. See Thanks, ya. Paul.
Thank you.